So welcome everyone also from my part to this third ANCF short course on introduction to neuroinformatics. As David pointed out, my name is Maria Lena Linne and I'm at Tampere University of Technology in Finland where I lead a computational neuroscience research group and I also coordinate national neuroinformatics activities in Finland. Uh, as David Wilshaw pointed out, uh, some four years ago, ANCF uh, introduced or, or established a group of people to make an ANCF training committee to kind of start advancing these kind of inter- and multidisciplinary studies in, in neuroscience. And uh, uh, here you see a list of people who are part of this training committee previous and present members and also the members from the INCF secretariat that have been very influential in, in for example, uh, setting up this, uh, this short course. Uh, I'm going to tell uh, like very introductory things in this 30 minute talk and then later on there will be specialized talks on, on various uh, subfields of neuroinformatics. So I'm going to motivate you to understand why do we need neuroinformatics, how to define it, and uh, kind of how, how we consider what are the subfields of neuroinformatics, and then something about uh, the course, and, uh, and then also applications that I see will be important in the future. Uh, we are all here to understand how brain works. And we would also like to understand what are the genetic, mo oh, sorry, <laughs> genetic molecular cellular mechanisms to understand how we learn, how we remember, and how we understand. And <clears throat> this is this is our goal at the end. Uh, but it's not all. So. There is additional thing that there are a lot of neurological diseases and disorders that are becoming more and more common uh, in our society. And without understanding the healthy functioning of the brain, we are not going to understand how, how these disorders or diseases develop and how to cure them. So this is another kind of motivation for us to do neuroscience and neuroinformatics, the way how we describe it. Uh, when we think about the brain, and when I look at it as a combined computational neuroscientist as an electro and as an electrophysiologist, I think that we actually understand quite little uh, currently. And this is a bold saying, but uh, I will justify it now next. So let's look at first the, the, the mammalian brain, in this case the human brain. And what we already understand quite well at this point is that uh, we know which brain region gets activated when we uh, perturb the, the system, when we, for example, we have gained this understanding using various imaging and electrophysiological measurements on humans. And we already understand quite well what types of cells are there, especially the neuronal types, what is their morphology, how the, what is their biophysical properties. So this is uh, what, we, what we are kind of uh, really good at uh, currently. And we understand, for example, in the case of uh, cerebral cortex, uh, uh, like where are the cells, uh, where these cells are positioned and so on. But there are uh, many other things that we still don't understand. And one of the, one of the important thing uh, at least to me, is that we don't understand how cells get connected. How do, the, how do these networks uh, uh, in the brain, how do they develop? We know that the, during the development, we get much more connections that then get disregarded later on during the life. And uh, one could ask that uh, who is governing this and how does this happen? Then the second issue that we don't understand well is that uh, there is a lot of homeostatic control and not to talk about plasticity and how do these phenomena emerge? What are the molecular, cellular and network level uh, mechanisms that, that kind of make us to learn and remember? 
And how, are, how is this homeostasis and plasticity uh, possibly intermingled? The third unknown aspect to me is that we don't understand well how are the other elements in the brain other than the neuronal elements like vessels, uh, glial cells and possibly also newborn cells. How are they involved in, in our cognitive phenomena, cognitive processing, information processing, plasticity, homeostasis. So there is a lot to uh, dig in and, uh, and uh, and the other aspect is that it's not only one brain region like the cerebral cortex that I talked about, but many other brain regions. And like if you compare the cerebellar cortex, it's a completely different structure. And in order to understand how information is processed, how this dynamic phenomena emerges in these structures, it's a challenge. And there we need something more than what we've been using so far. Uh, let's look at a little bit back to the history. So traditionally, all these questions that I was addressing, they've been studying uh, more or less in, in, in separate fields that are listed here, like fields on molecular neuroscience, uh, cellular neuroscience, uh, neuroanatomy, neurophysiology, uh, systems neuroscience, cognitive neuroscience, and lately also computational and theoretical neuroscience. But this has, we have to realize that these fields have been relatively separated and researchers may not be even talking between these different, uh, between these different sub-disciplines. And there is something we need to do in the future, especially considering the fact that we have a variety of experimental techniques uh, ranging from subcellular resolution up to whole brain scale. <laughs> to make sense out of this data that we are massively producing now. So we are entering a data age and something needs to be done so that we can understand how the dynamics emerges in our brain from the structure and function that exists there. So this is sort of a, a very brief uh, introduction and motivation for you to justify why we are doing this course and why we try to make you to believe that uh, uh, we really need to take some additional tools, not only these tools that are listed here, and there are many more on this experimental side, so this is only a glimpse of them. And we at INCF consider that the answer to make sense out of this uh, complexity that we have in the brain is neuroinformatics. And neuroinformatics is defined as integration of information across all levels and scales of nervous system from genes to behavior. So we want to start understanding not only the behavior or the dynamics at one level, but combine it. Start understanding across multiple scales. Uh, neuroinformatics can be considered to be in the intersection between neuroscience and uh, information science. Uh, something, a little bit uh, background information about ANSIF, who is behind, who is funding us and who is making available this course and allowing us to be here. So ANSIF was established in 2005 and uh, its primary aim is to sort of uh, uh, promote establishing infrastructure that will help the acquisition and annotation of di diverse data sets to achieve multi-scale and multi-omic data in integration from genes to behavior again. So this is the ultimate uh, uh, aim. And here are some kind of like uh, missions that uh, have been originally proposed for ANCF. So ANCF is supposed to be very international, provide infrastructure support, and uh, it kind of promotes uh, freely accessible data and analysis resources and seamless flow of information and knowledge. So it's this kind of neutral uh, uh, organization that 17 countries so far have been joining.
To make neuroinformatics a little bit more uh, practical, uh, I have listed here a couple of items that I consider are important parts of uh, neuroinformatics. So first of all, ANSIF develops standards and good practices for data acquisition and storage provenance, data sharing, publishing, analysis, visualization and modeling and simulation. So it's sort of like a organization that tries to bring these various views together and tries to make some sort of standard way of how to measure signals, how to take images, how to share models and so on. Then the other aspect is that it develops federated databases, meaning that, uh, that we would be easier, like there exists already a lot of databases all over the world, but to make them more accessible, maybe through some kind of like a single access point. And then on top of all that, ANSIF promotes developing theoretical uh, computation and simulation tools for quantitative modeling of neural functions. <clears throat> Let's look at next a typical situation in neuroscience research. So there could be these kind of questions like, are you willing to give your data uh, uh, to, be, to be shared and are you willing to take the time to be make it available? Are there places where you could store your data and can somebody read your data? and can it be understood? So these kind of questions could come around. And the answer for a neuroscientist who is really busily trying to make the PhD thesis or get results published, the answer is normally no, I don't have time for this. Unless it's planned from the beginning on in the project. And what INCF and also other initiatives worldwide try to achieve is that uh, we try to promote developing, first of all, ontology. This is the vocabulary of neuroscience data and automated methods, methods to uh, metadata capture. And metadata is, again, the data that is additional to the signal or image or original raw data. <clears throat> and basically, this means that everything would be automated. You can have something still in, on your notebooks if you are a wet lab person, but at the end, everything would be documented in, an, in a kind of digitized manner. Then, as I already pointed out, uh, there is an emphasis to develop federated uh, database systems uh, and develop standardized and comprehensive metadata schemes, meaning that we sort of have a model uh, for metadata not a model of the neural function, but the model of your data, which would be transferred through the, the workflow uh, from the recording until perhaps the building of mathematical model. So this metadata would always follow the data that you are using, whatever you are doing in, 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 in neuroscience field. And of course, uh, INCF and other organizations in the globally, they, they favor to develop methods to ensure interoperability of uh, tools and, and systems. Uh, one example of the, this kind of federated database is INCF database uh, that has been uh, set up a, a couple of years ago. And, uh, there, the idea is that you have like local, maybe in each country, uh, local databases, and then this could be kind of <coughs> visualized through a single uh, access point like uh, INCF uh, uh, services or, or some, by some other means. INCF is by no means alone doing these things. There are many other uh, large-scale brain initiatives that are more, a little bit more like research driven. We have to remember that INCF is to support the standard development, tool development and such. Uh, there are research projects like uh, uh, Allen Institute for uh, Brain Science, Human Brain Project, One Mind in the United States, that are these kind of large scale 
uh, brain initiatives. They have research questions, but at the same time, they also develop infrastructure and tools to do neuroinformatics research. And INCF is linked with most of these uh, big initiatives in the way that it provides uh, standards and tools and infrastructure overall. What are then the subfields of neuroinformatics? When we first looked at it at the INCF training committee, we had a variety of suggestions, but we came up with this, pretty much with this list. So uh, there is, first of all, there is neurobiology, which is the starting point. Without studying the brain experimentally, we don't know what's going on there. Then there are databases and this kind of big field from the informatics point of view. There is data analysis, which is a big field as such. There is modeling, both <coughs> theoretical and data driven. And there is simulation and computation workflows. And at the end, there is also neuromorphic and uh, neural engineering. So this is how we consider neuroinformatics. And there may be uh, other views, but this is how we take it. And this has been actually a starting point to develop also this, uh, this uh, short course. We want to give you a brief glimpse of all these fields to kind of get you a starting point to go on with more advanced courses and more advanced studies. And this is how the program uh, came out. So as I pointed out, there are talks or lectures for all these subfields. And of course, the, the, the problem there is that we cannot go into too many details with most of these things. But at least I think you will get during these two days, you get out like what are the challenges in this field and what is important to develop next. Um, I will now briefly go through each of these uh, um, lectures and to get you an idea what we are going to go through in this, during these two days. So, uh, first of all, there, is, uh, there are two lectures about looking at the brain, meaning that how to look at the brain from the inside and from outside. So this is basically microscopic, microscopic and macroscopic imaging techniques. These talks will be given by Ignacio Arcanda Carreras here, and then Jean Baptiste Pauline. And I just wanted to point out that uh, although in the beginning I pointed out that uh, we know very little about the brain, but I meant from the dynamic point of view, but if we consider that the times of Cajal, the beginning of 1900, we've come quite along from that, of course. And then the third uh, uh, lecture is about probing the brain, data analysis and neural coding, and it's going to be given by Jonathan Victor sitting over there. Uh, and, uh, and the goal there is to kind of analyze the obtained signals by statistical means. So this is kind of a a really huge field as such. There are even confer almost like a conferences on this topic and you have to understand and now we cover it, cover it in one and a half hour, so it's tough. But, uh, but uh, the idea is to get kind of a broad view of neuroinformatics. So we want to have this lecture also there. Uh, once we have obtained the images and recorded the signals and analyzed them and understand something how that has to be done, then there is an additional step to the to be taken, and this is modeling the brain, putting all this information that we know about our, uh, our system, whether it is the, uh, some cell in, in the brain or, or a local network or some brain region, so to put that data uh, into some framework. And uh, at this course, we are going to have two talks about uh, modeling the brain. 
Kautze Einewal will, will first uh, talk about uh, more how to make the mat mathematical models uh, of neural systems. Also covering uh, the multiscale modeling, which is kind of uh, uh, coming, uh, coming in the future. And then Mark Olivel Kewaltik is going to talk more, concentrate more on how you then analyze these mathematical models by means of uh, uh, simulation, computation and workflows. If you, if, you <clears throat> if you consider now the brain, what we typically do in, in wet lab work, we give a stimulus, no matter whether it is a cell and you, uh, you poke it with an electrode or you look at the, some larger area. You give a stimulus, you perturb your system and then you measure a response. For those of you who come more with a biological background, then what we do in computational, in mathematical and computational modeling, we replace our system with some sort of equations and we try to develop models of neural systems applying mathematical modeling and computer simulation. It's important to note that a good theoretical model can always predict the future. One can make a guess what are the mechanisms behind certain phenomena and then you can test it with your model. So this is what is typically done, but on top of that, good models really predict uh, some emerging phenomena that then will be tested later on by wet lab experimental work. And this is the benefit of modeling. <clears throat> I wanted to discuss a little bit also different types of modeling already in this, uh, uh, this introductory talk. And I consider uh, there are two ways uh, of understanding modeling. So one can think about it like from the complexity of model. Uh, there are simplified conceptual models that many times can be analyzed even by analytical tools. So you don't need a, a, a computer for that. And then there are these hugely detailed models that you need to run computer simulations in order to know what goes on there. The other way to classify or look at the models is the direction of workflow. Like uh, you can think of building models starting from the bottom or uh, from the top down. And uh, I would like to say that all these approaches that are listed here, they are at this point when we then know what is the right approach, they are equally beneficial. So all of them needed and the better the, the more you combine these, the better, I think. But of course, some people favor some approach and others uh, another approach. What, what I would like to point out here, that if you are, for example, building models, this kind of mean field models, where, uh, where you only look at the behavior of some population of neurons, for example, and how these populations then interact, there you can study kind of like uh, emerging phenomena in in these kind of larger areas in the brain, but you don't be able to say what is the role of this specific guy on the, on the emerging uh, phenomena. On the other hand, if you select to do this type of modeling, which is very biophysical modeling, you take into account all ion channels, receptors on the cell membrane, even describe some intracellular phenomena, then you are able to ask what is the role of this specific uh, uh, let's say, specific morphological confirmation or specific ion channel on your emerging dynamic uh, phenomena. So this is kind of the difference between these approaches. But I would point out, I would like to point out that they are equally important, I think, at this point, since we still don't know what is the right approach to do these things. How do computational models help? So I've listed here uh, the items uh, that I consider. So I consider myself 
computational models of neural systems already some sort of database. So although they wouldn't have predictive capability, they integrate experimental data. And it's easier to see the relationships of different elements in your neural system if you combine things in, in this kind of mathematical model. They describe neural systems, fit existing data, they make predictions if the model is, is really good. They also provide mechanistic understanding of the neural system and they provide, hopefully in the future, more ways to study diseases and how they develop. And they provide principles to develop new technology in engineering. Uh, once, we've, once we have our data, we've modeled the system and this is typically done, like I pointed out, in individual research uh, groups or projects. So where do we go from here? Uh, uh, the, the next talk in our uh, short course is going to be given by Mary and Marton sitting here uh, about databases, ontologies and in general how to share data. Uh, I've listed here a couple of uh, issues that are important in, in considering uh, this topic. So these questions, they start from the fact that how to make scientists agree, first of all, to share data and how to create citation system for experimental and modeled or simulated data. And then the list goes further, how to present metadata of an experiment in understandable, machine readable way and how to combine multiple autonomous database systems into single federated or virtual database. So these are the important questions that are within this subfield of neuroinformatics and I don't think they are solved so far. So there is a lot, lot of work for those who have more like informatics and computer science background also in this subfield of neuroinformatics. Where do we use all this data and knowledge that we gain? So, as I pointed out in the beginning, we want to understand how the brain works. But we also want to solve at least some of the commonly existing diseases or disorders that, for example, we humans have. Uh, I've selected here uh, two examples how we could utilize the, the data about the normal functioning of the brain in order to help patients in the future. This is more like a future driven now, so this is not kind of a routine like a, a clinical, routinely, this is not used in, in, in a routine manner in a clinical setting. But uh, there are interesting uh, studies done related to electrical high frequency deep brain stimulation. For example, the computational models, the similar type of models that, the, for example, Kaute Einewal and Mark Orivel Kevaltik are going to present here, they've been successfully used uh, for unlearning pathological neural synchronization and synaptic couple in some cer certain types of Parkinson's disease patients by this group in Germany. There are already publications on this. Then another is more, a little bit more science fiction still, but uh, uh, it's been done uh, with Aplusia so far. It's a much simpler system than humans, of course, and it's easier to show these things there. But their computational models, models have been used for prediction of training or stimulation protocols for impaired function of molecular networks associated with learning and memory. And perhaps something like this, this once we really understand what's going on in the brain could be done for those who have like uh, impaired functions uh, of, uh, of, uh, of the brain, for example, related to memory. And these two are examples where you, without any drugs, do something to kind of guide the brain go into the right direction. So we should remember that it's, it doesn't always have to be a drug that, need, 
that is kind of developed and 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 would be the 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 would help us, but it may be also something else. Then application areas exist also, like I pointed out, in the engineering fields, in neuromorphic engineering, and 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 in developing all sorts of intelligent toys, devices, autonomous cars, robots, neuroprosthesis, perhaps even artificial brains in the future, similar to humans. And Chi Chi Liu is going to talk about neuromorphic engineering at this uh, short course. Uh, so we cover also, also this area. Uh, <coughs> After this very brief introduction to, the intro, to, the, to neuroinformatics, I still wanted to take one issue up here. And I wanted to talk about what really is required to do neuroinformatics. You are all young, uh, uh, starting your career in this field, uh, like I was some 20 years ago. And I wish I had all this information available at that time, but I didn't. Uh, but over these years, I've started to think that it would be important to emphasize for every student going to neuroscience field. And now I talk this big neuroscience field where also neuroinformatics is part of. That all of you should have some basic understanding of neuroscience. But then on top of that, you should pick up a couple of topics on this list. And this is by no means exhaustive, but it's a, it's a couple of examples. So you should have programming skills, experience with informatics, experience with signal processing or image analysis or statistical data analysis and machine learning methods. And perhaps some of you with complex systems theory and analysis. So you should pick up one, two or three of these topics where you become a specialist in order to really do well in neuroscience. And this is what I see most of the uh, neuroscience programs, at least in small countries, they are still not doing this. So they are not interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary. They only typically teach neuroscience and maybe some statistical analysis, but that's, that's it. But it would be important if you are able to during your bachelor, master and PhD and early postdoc time, if you could kind of like select a couple of these topics to become or master them, it would be really helpful for the rest of your career, I think. <clears throat> and with these words, I think we are going to go on and uh, and uh, before I give the talk uh, to Ignacio Arcanda Carreras I will point out the same as David that uh, this is a short course we are only going to be here two days and uh, compared to many longer summer schools it's a short time to get to know each other so we should understand that immediately starting from the first coffee break you have to start associating with, with each other, start discussing with each other, and we should interact a lot. So I would imagine that since every, every talk is like one hour and 30 minutes, so you are allowed to interact and, and ask questions. And also during the, uh, the breaks and social sessions, I hope we have very good discussions. One additional thing that I wanted to point out, is, so one important aspect this year is the open forum uh, tomorrow where we discuss uh, the questions that some of you have sent uh, regarding neuroinformatics. And uh, this is supposed to be a really lively session and we are supposed to discuss and all these experts should be here. So you could still, you still have like uh, two days time to think about some really crucial questions uh, and I think this is a wonderful chance here to get the opinions like what would need to be studied in the future and, and so on, future topics. So I thank you and welcome Ignacio. Thank you.